Hello fellow plot questers, today I've got this book on bullshit by Harry G. Frankfurt. And I today I will break down what this book entails, the logic that it uses to define bullshit, and my personal opinion on its definition. It's written by, again, Harry G. Frankfurt, who is apparently a professor of philosophy at Princeton University. So he's kind of an expert in this field. So I will, yeah, I'll break down the logic the book uses, and let's get straight into it. So, first, uh, he first you, tries to use humbug as the start to defining bullshit, because he believes humbug is the closest synonym to bullshit, and since bullshit hasn't been exclusively defined philosophically or linguistically, he felt that humbug, which does have kind of like an essay kind of breaking down what it means, can be used as a reference. So he begins by defining humbug using a predetermined definition, and that definition stated, deceptive misrepresentation, short of lying, especially by pretentious word or deed of somebody's own thoughts, feelings, or attitudes. And as, as you can see, it, it seems kind of similar to what we perceive as bullshit, right? Like, when you're bullshitting somebody, you're kind of almost lying to them, but you're not lying to them, you're like boasting, exaggerating, bluffing even. So, you know, that this definition of humbug seems pretty similar to of what we conventionally consider as bullshit. And he starts to kind of break down each part of this definition. And he, oh, he seems to focus the most on the difference between humbug and lying. He states that lying has two misrepresentations, uh, which basically, okay, what does that mean, right? What do you mean two representations? Let's say I, I lie to you about how much money I have in my pocket. I say, I've got, I've got 20 bucks in my pocket, right? I don't have anything in my pocket right now. There are two things that I'm deceiving you about. First, I'm deceiving you about what's actually in the pocket. The second thing I'm deceiving you about is uh, my perception of what's in my pocket because I know that isn't true, right? I don't have 20 bucks in my pocket. I know that for sure. So by saying this, by defining this, we're saying that lying ex kind of bends the truth completely. It destroys the truth. It goes opposite of truth. And I'm misrepresenting two things the actual thing that I'm lying to you about, and my perception of the thing, because I know it's not true, right? And he, and he felt that, and he kind of concludes using several different strands of logic that humbug is perhaps a way to deceive someone not of facts, like, you know, like, ooh, like this thing, like this, ooh, I don't, I don't have this book in my pocket, you know, like, I don't have it. That's, that's fact, right? That's a fact. But not of that particular fact, but of a certain type of perception of an individual. And he uses the example of a military procession here. He says that, okay, so let's say there's a military pr procession, and he's like, our founding forefathers, then with the power of divine will of God has created this mighty nation. And, you know, you can't exactly accuse him of lying, right? He's not trying to deceive you. He might not particularly believe that their, the founding fathers had divine guidance and and he, he might not even like the Founding Fathers, but he isn't necessarily trying to deceive you about the facts of the Founding Fathers. He's trying to make a perception of himself. He's trying to make you think, make you think that he's a patriotic person, right? So he, he feels that humbug is something among those lines, something like a boast, a bluff, a, a facade even. And then he kind of pulls out Wittgenstein out of nowhere and starts to talk about his motto. In the elder days of art, builders wrought with the greatest care, each minute and unseen part, for the gods are everywhere. Now, this basically talks about how, basically, oh my gosh, there's no true art anymore, right? Back in the good old days, artists would pay attention to every single detail. They, they knew that the gods would look at every single part, even the bottom of the statue, so they made sure that every part of their art was perfect, right? And, and that, that's kind of super, super, super important, because this kind of accounts to bullshit as well, right? Because when it comes to bullshit, we never really... There's almost, like, too much bullshit these days, right? Like, like back in the old days, there was no bullshit. No one would ever kind of just, just humbug over things. They wouldn't just bluff over things. It would be done carefully, delicately, with precision. And that's kind of the argument he starts to talk about. So in the elder days of art, there was no bullshit. But then, let, okay, wait, th there's an argument right here. There's an argument to be made here because you can counter that point by saying, hey, like politicians and like, you know, advertisements, they all kind of count as bullshit 
because they're not necessarily, again, we remember we said humbug and bullshit was kind of related and we concluded that humbug was kind of related to almost changing or deceiving someone in terms of perception, not of facts, right? So if, but advertisement and politicians, that's exactly what they do. They're trying to create a sort of image for themselves that's not necessarily true, but they're not exactly deceiving you of pure facts. But then that can be done very artistically, right? Not no, artistically is the wrong word, uh, with mastery, right? Because politicians, they study really hard and like they, they do market research, psychology, like for economists, right? For advertisement. So both advertisers and politicians they practice a lot and master their craft. They master their craft of bullshitting people. So you can't say that, hey, you know, like it's not precise, right? But then there's a very distinct difference here because bullshit distinctly always tries to get away with something, right? Which is a point that he makes. And he then makes an example of Pascal. Pascal, who was clothed with Wittgenstein, apparently uh, she hurt her toe or something. She was, she was very, very sick. And she said, oh my god, I feel as sick as a dog who got run over or something among the lines. And Wittgenstein replied in absolute disgust, like, you don't know what a dog feels like. And although the author, and myself as well, probably, we think Wittgenstein was probably joking, you know, like, he might have been joking. But, like, taking Pascal's thoughts at face value, uh, Wittgenstein was disgusted by that. Why? Because he realized that... Pascal doesn't care about the truth value of the statement, right? She doesn't care if precisely what she is feeling is like the dogs. Although it is a connotative statement, is an elusive statement, she, uh, according to Wittgenstein, that's still not necessarily a, a truth, right? It, it, in fact, it just doesn't care about truth in the first place. She doesn't care at the moment if, if exactly how she feels is related to how a dog feels. She just cares that she wants to express her pain, right? She's trying to change the perception of Wittgenstein. She's trying to make people understand and relate with her pain. And here, she manages to define bullshit. He believes that the lying is the antithesis of truth. It attempts to deny it completely. But if lying is the antithesis of truth, then it must be known that lying is always aware of truth, what truth is. A liar is knows that they are lying. For example, if I'm lying about, let's say, how much money I have in my pocket, again, with that example, then I'm very aware that I've got no money in my pocket. Um, however, I'm intentionally deceiving you. That also means that I know what the truth is. I know I don't have, a, I don't have money in my pocket. That knowledge is the important part. I'm aware of it. Because lie, if the lie is the antithesis of truth, then it must also be very aware of truth. And that's the same for truth seekers. I say, hey, I got no money in my pockets, right? I'm aware that there is no money in my pockets. And I'm aware that if I say that there is money, then that would be lying. I'm aware of the opposite. So basically, liars and, liars and truths, as explained by this book, by this book on bullshit, they're kind of playing the same game. They're, they're on the same playing field. They're just on different sides. But bullshit, bullshit just does not care about the truth value. They doesn't care if, if what they say is true or not true or a combination of both. It can be true or false. And that doesn't matter. All bullshit cares about is creating a sort of perception of themselves or getting away with something. And this is his final definition of bullshit. It's kind of a strange midway between truth and lie. And in some ways, it is more dangerous than lies themselves because lying is aware of the truth at least. Bullshit just doesn't care about truth. It doesn't know the truth. And what it says might be true, it might not be true, but that makes it even more dangerous in real life. And that is what he calls bullshit and on bullshit. And okay, so, so now let's talk about kind of my opinions, my opinions on bullshit. Uh, first of all, I think bullshit is a very useful tool in everyday life because, you know, we are forced to do bullshit pretty much small bits of it in any kind of, in any kind of interaction within the day, right? Like, you will be made to talk about something you're not necessarily interested in and you might say, you might try to bullshit your way out of it, right? Like, like someone might ask me, hey, are you interested in this particular K-pop girl group? And I might be like, hey, I'm not interested in that girl group, but I don't want to make this person feel bad, so I guess I'll pretend to ask interested, and I'll just say a bunch of random generic things about girl groups and, and bullshit my way through it. 
And that, that is like daily usage of bullshit, right? So it's like a useful tool. And again, like the author also mentions like how like advertisers and like economists and like people who are trying to like market stuff and people who are politicians trying to convince people, debaters, like all these people, they're bullshitting, right? That, that's what they're doing. They're trying to intentionally create a perception of themselves in order to get away with something. And I think that, you know, that's not necessarily a bad thing all the time, right? It can be used as a tool. It is useful sometimes. And like kind of referencing almost like Plato's Republic, right? Sometimes it's necessary for the higher ups who kind of know what they're doing to use bullshit as a tool in order to control the masses to kind of make sure society stays together, right? But the problem is bullshit can cloud the truth. Like, someone speaking absolute nonsense and bullshit can beat a person who's speaking the absolute truth and that is a problem of the matter. Because, of course, we can say that, oh, bullshit can be used for positive things, bullshit can be used for neutral things, but bullshit cannot actually be, be considered as a truth. It's connected to lies and, and it's closer to lie than truth. But since it doesn't care about the truth value at all, it is actually far more deceiving than it actually could be, than lies actually are. Hence, I think bullshit is a tool that we all need in our lives and is needed for the government to use, for, for marketers to use, for everyone to use, really, because all of us bullshit a little bit in our, entire, in, in our days. But it's important to sh make sure that we are aware of the truth. And the fact is, we need to be aware that bullshit is a dangerous thing. So it's, it's basically like, you know, nuclear energy, right? Like, it's dangerous, it's really useful, but it's dangerous, and we need to be aware of both. And I think that's my general conclusion. Again, this is a really interesting book. I read it in like 30 minutes, it's fine. It's it's really quick read. Uh, I obviously like grossly oversimplified what this man said in his essay, so read it. If you're interested, you should be able to buy it. Yeah, that's about it. Have a great day, everyone. And like always, your plot quester, Aaron the Plot Coaster. Have a great day, guys, and good bye.